Please welcome Duncan Southwell. Thanks very much. Uh, I realize I've got the uh, after lunch spot, so I'll try and uh, keep my voice nice and low so you can all just uh, sleep for an hour or two. Um, I see on the, the program uh, the, it was actually innovative ways to access capital or something the like. Given that I've worked in banking for 15 years, um, and some would call it the second oldest profession, others would probably align it to the world's oldest profession. Um, <laughs> I think innovation in the title was probably a, you know, a bit optimistic. What we're going to do today is, um, it's really just a, a discussion on the different forms of capital businesses can access during their company life cycle, and I suppose the, uh, the ins and outs and the constraints that uh, each bring with them um, due to a company size or, or time in the market. What we're going to focus on today um, really is the different forms of capital um, for those in startup or in a high growth phase. We won't really be focusing um, uh, on more mature companies. Um, I think they're a different kind of kettle of fish and bring their own considerations. Um, no apologies. The topics that I'm going to cover today are pretty broad, so I'm not going to go into a lot of depth. Each one of them could really you know, be a, a speaker session in itself. But uh, it's more just a commentary, um, and feel free to ask questions at the end. I think what we'll start off with um, is really just the uh, different sources of capital that we're really alluding to. At one end of the spectrum, I suppose, and at the genesis of any company is uh, that of equity. Um, you know, what are the key attributes to equity? Uh, firstly, uh, payment flexibility. It's the most flexible or financially flexible form of capital out there in the market. What do we really mean to by that? Well, it doesn't really have any constraints on the way it's paid back, uh, unlike debt or mezzanine financing. Um, what does it bring with it? Well, it's ownership. Those putting in equity uh, own the company, so it's got a fair bit of operational control uh, associated with equity. And because I suppose it's the most financially flexible and is in at the start, it's inherently taking the most risk. So if you look at it um, over a kind of cost of capital, it's going to be the one re requiring the highest return. Swing to the other end of the spectrum, and you've got senior debt. I mean, it's probably the most uh, inflexible form of capital. It's the one that, uh, as soon as you draw it, it requires to be repaid and interest payments made on it from day one, generally. What it, what it also does is doesn't really impact on ownership at all. Um, you know, it's there to be repaid. It, it's not going to come and, and sit at your board meetings. It has no real operational control of a company. It's going to be tied to the financial performance of a company, um, you know, because all it wants to do is really be paid back. Um, it, it's looking at your revenue streams and pretty much sizing itself on that. Um, and as you know, with that kind of attribute, it's not that risky. So as a result, in terms of cost of capital, it's probably going to be one of your more cheapest costs of uh, funding. I've alluded to mezzanine finance. We're not really going to go into that in any way, shape, or form today. But what I'm referring to is that's just the whole raft of instruments pretty much sitting in between debt and equity. So you, know, you hear subordinated debt, convertible bonds, redeemable preference shares, hybrid equity, and all, all the like. All they are is really taking certain attributes of debt and equity um, and arranging it for investors as the way they see fit or financiers. Let's jump into equity and I suppose sources of it. Just to explain my little graph a little bit here. Y-axis, that's just money, um, how much money is required. And on the X-axis, this is company life cycle, or almost a proxy for time. So we're going from concept to start up through a growth phase, expansion, and I suppose sitting off the e end here would be a mature company. I mean, generically, um, equity um, is taking the, the first in risk. You have your owner operator, and this graph, I suppose, along the four uh, or five things here, these would be third party in uh, investors that join owner operators through the time scale. Um, the yellow line there, that's investment. Um, in the company, so that covers a lot of things. That can be startup costs, it can be the building, it can be the staff, it can be the working capital, the inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And then you see pretty much a red line, whether it's hope or reality, those are the sales that follow. So obviously you invest money in a company and then you get revenue streams off the back of it. Um, the green line is pretty much the solver. That's just risk. So when you're putting money into a company and nothing's coming out, you view it as risky. When you've uh, got a lot of money being generated and your investment's starting to tail off, you, you're seen as less risky. 
So pretty easy solve in there. In the New Zealand market, I suppose um, third party investors, these three groups, the angels, seed funds, venture capital, tend to get squashed together a little bit. Um, it's not a big market, it's not hugely delineated. Um, so you can see certain firms or groups of investors that will pretty much take the risks associated with um, any of those kind of three groups. I suppose what's important um, when you're looking at these investor sets is really what are their objectives um, and understanding those before they actually come into, in, in, into a company. Um, you know, key consideration is how they're going to exit. How long are they there for? Are they there for just three years so they can, they can really help you realise this ramp up in growth but then they're going to be looking for an exit straight away? Or are they there more longer term? Uh, do they want to share in the kind of company's returns once it is up here? Because it's going to drive quite a few um, behavioural things. And of course, equity equals ownership. So these are the people you're going to be alongside. The second one here is, I suppose, then talking to debt. Quite a different creature to equity. Um, as I kind of alluded to before, debt just wants to be repaid. Um, it doesn't see a lot of upside in growth and therefore doesn't really value growth. You know, what, how does that holistically you know, kind of manifest itself? Well, if you had the same company with the same revenues, one had a forecast of 10% growth and the other one had a 3% growth, you know, roughly you could say they could borrow the same amount of money. It's not looking at this growth path and believing it. It's really going to, your debt capacity is going to be determined of what, you, what your sales have done to date. Um, now, inevitably, and I'm sure many of you have experienced out there, we've got this thing called a growth gap. So debt's pretty much sizing off the sales curve here, but you need to make your investments to realise that growth here. And of course, you, 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 most of your equity's gone, you, know, you don't want to put any more in, you go to the bank to try and fill that hole. Now, banks have come up with a lot of products to try and bridge that gap. You have asset financing, debtor financing, invoice financing, and, and uh, numerous others. But fundamentally, that gap is only going to be narrowed, it's not going to be closed. So I suppose that's the growth gap that I'm going to refer to as we go along um, a bit further. Now what I'm going to do is switch probably um, and focus at companies in startup phase and in high growth phase. As I said, we were going to look at the start and have a look at the, some of the constraints around these two forms of, of capital. So in a startup, what does the company look like? Um, you know, you, you've thrown all your money in, um, you've scrounged off relatives, friends, neighbours. You've probably mortgaged the house, the car, firstborn, anything you can, capital's running short. You go to the bank, as I said before, there's that growth gap, they, they can only fund so much. So, you know, you are where you are. Um, so the, the next port of call when people are looking for capital is, do I bring a third party investor in, in the startup phase? Now typically the problem's gonna be, as you bring that uh, financial third party in, you're down here. You've worked with the company for you know, years probably. You have a very firm view on what this growth path is going to look like, and it all looks very good. Of course, a third party investor is coming along. You're here. Their projection is more likely going to be this red line, and you've got this big valuation gap. And this is where a lot of um, companies in startup um, phase that are actually going out there to look for third party investors in their company spend a lot of time trying to close this valuation gap in frustration, and a lot of deals don't actually happen because of this real mismatch and alignment on a company. And therefore, probably equity raising in the startup phase is a hard task. I'm not saying it can't be done, um, it's just a lot of ha harder than certainly um, companies that are out here in the mature phase, um, and even for um, companies in a high, high growth phase. So I suppose that's not really um, giving a, a very cheery picture of you know, how, how can you access that capital for growth then. Something that we'd probably just pay, point a bit of attention to is that of the working capital cycle and realising um, how capital can actually be released um, from this to aid that growth that is probably so important in that startup phase. I, I think um, from talking to a lot of customers out there, especially in the startup phase, always looking to give the best possible terms to both your customers and your suppliers as you establish in the market, probably just doing some analysis out there on what that's costing you before you give it away. Um, what are we talking about when we're talking releasing capital from the working capital um, cycle? We're talking about shortening your payment terms from your customers, extending your payment terms from your suppliers. That can be done in just pure physical terms, how long it takes you to settle on both sides. It can also be done by you know, just having a look at how your operations function. Make sure that when cash comes in, it's actually being swept to the right place, that it's not sitting in accounts redundant for days, and you're not really being inefficient with the limited capital that you do have. <coughs> 
It's also making sure that you've got the right type of financing. You haven't just gone to your bank or your financier and asked for one big lump of debt. You've split it into asset financing or debtor financing. You've got working capital, you've got core debt, and you're using them appropriately. I just thought I'd do a quick example you know, of the magnitude of the capital that can be released here. I'm just going to do it on uh, days payable terms. So just taking a company that um, spends, let's say, $50 million a year um, to its suppliers. On average, it's got 50, we'd call it a 58 days days payable, which means on any, any one day, it, um, there, there's $7.9 million outstanding um, or it owes to its suppliers. If you shifted those terms by just one day, that means on average you'd have $8.1 million outstanding. So you've pretty much just coughed up 200000 right there and then by just changing your terms by one day. It doesn't seem like a lot, but if you could do it for 10 days, there's $1.4 million just by changing payment terms. You could do exactly the same equation on the other side with your receivables. Um, if you don't want to look at it in terms of actual capital release for the business, if you just repay debt and let's say you're borrowing at 7.5%, it means you're probably going to save about $100,000 a year on interest costs alone. So by having a close look at this, you know, it might just be the most efficient form of capital that you can release from your business when capital is tight. Moving into what we kind of loosely put the high growth phase here. So what's the, what's the big point of difference? Well, basically, you've just got a few runs on the board. So instead of being down here, where all is forecast growth um, is, is a pipe dream, maybe to a third party investor, um, you've actually got some runs on the board and you've kind of set a trajectory. What does that mean in terms of your access to debt? Probably not a lot. As I said at the start, you know, debt doesn't really value growth that highly. They might loosen up some of your lending terms and the like, a small release of quantum, but you're still going to have that growth gap that we referred to. What may have changed is access to third party equity. The valuations, or well, that valuation gap may have narrowed. So you can actually have real conversations with people that want to invest in your business um, and come to an agreement on those terms. Now that, I suppose, leads to the question, do you want to raise this equity? So at this point in time, you know, do you want a third party investor coming in? You need the capital, you kind of know it, but you need to really answer some pretty fundamental questions. And, and really it, is, it comes down to the crux is how important is growth to your company? Now, the first one I've kind of put up there is, can you survive without it? Where you've got to? Are you in a market you know, position that you can defend? You know, have you got the, the size? Have you got the supply lines? You know, have you got the chains? Have you got access to customer markets that are going to be sustainable? So if you don't follow this growth, you can survive uh, you know, infinitum. Secondly, how much do you want it? At the, it's an owner-operator business, for instance. You've got 100%. You've got 100% of the upside right now. Would you prefer to keep 100% of that upside um, and slow your growth rate down to, say, 3%, or would you, let's say, sell half the business and take a 10 or 15% growth rate? And lastly, but probably more importantly, are you prepared to share control? Now, undoubtedly, if somebody puts equity in your business, there's some form of control given up. So are you ready to make that change? And it's quite a big one. I think the next point we want to make around that, if you decide you actually are going to go out there um, and raise it, because of that whole control issue, a lot of people are just going out there saying, who's going to give me the money on the cheapest terms and take the least control? And from our experience and what we see across the market, really that question should almost be last. Focusing on things like, what else can an investor bring my company in terms of vertical integration, in terms of access to new markets? And you know, maybe the, the best one is governance and expertise. You're in a high growth phase. You're the nature of your business is probably changing. What can somebody externally coming in with money, with money, with skin in the game, but what can they add to the, these three paths um, outside of just money? Um, funnily enough, if you actually target these, you know, if, you, if you went through each one of these, the type of investor you're looking for may be your customer to give you access to new markets, it might be your supplier in terms of vertical integration. Um, and it, look, it, it may even be a competitor that wants a stake in your game or see some kind of alignment there. If you're looking at these people, you might just start narrowing that valuation gap a bit further as well. You've got projections of how your sales are going to grow. If they're in the industry, if they have expertise, they may have similar opinions. And again, it might just kind of reinforce the whole loop rather than going out there just saying, who's going to give me money on the best possible terms? They may understand it better. Now, overseas investment has probably been topical for the last five or 10 years, and it normally takes the 
the subject of inbound Asian investment. You can kind of see the strategic rationale behind that. That is, um, New Zealand companies getting access to high growth markets, and on the flip side of the equation, um, Asian investors in those high, high profile markets securing supply lines of you know, high quality New Zealand goods, IP, services, et cetera. Um, what we tend to find is a lot of these actually generally, rather than direct purchases of the companies, end up in JV agreements. Now, kind of rolling back into the, uh, the presentation, we were talking about access to capital. That probably doesn't help a lot. It actually means you require more capital uh, to put out to form the JV, unless you're doing it for some kind of share swap. Um, you can still get a lot of those synergies through major minority shareholdings, and a lot of the time that, that's how they actually manifest, but it doesn't al always mean that capital is going to be coughed up. You've got further complications, you know, outside the, the, the cultural ones and operating ones. You know, you may hit overseas investment office considerations, and that's a process that you need to go through. So it does add a level of complexity outside of a domestic investor. Um, and it doesn't always need to f take, the uh, take the form of direct investment. You know, if somebody is coming from overseas and you need help ca with capital in your, in your business, it may be able to be done by simple things just like prepayment agreements for goods that you're supplying. Um, you know, conversely, we have the export credit agency here looking to help Kiwis actually put their businesses into other markets. That might be another form of capital that can really bridge the gap during that high growth phase. I think the last thing that we really want to say just on overseas investment, it should be treated no differently than any, any other form of investment. Again, it's not just cheap money coming from an anonymous source that's not going to stick their hand in your business. It's about what they can do to actually help your business out um, at the same time as providing capital for growth. Realise it wasn't probably the longest speaking spot we got today, but look, just in summary, you know, what we're we trying to say is that you are going to have capital constraints in that startup and high growth phase. Um, debt is probably not going to fund all the growth that you envisage during those phases. And you've, you've really got to take a long, hard think about how you're going to raise that capital. In the startup, just looking at your internal operations may be the easiest way and the least fuss way to actually access it. Bringing investors into the tent, really look to what they can bring your business just outside of capital um, and how they can strategically align with you. Um, and overseas investment, you know, it's just another form of that um, and it can really open access and, and really help you achieve the, those, that growth path. Who are you going to talk to um, actually around that? We probably think having a word to your banker, they're, they're going to be the harbingers of bad news anyway. They're going to be telling you you haven't got access to enough debt to achieve the growth that you want. But they're seeing a lot of pe same people in the same situation. They probably have good coverage in the sector. Um, and you know, if not having all the solutions, they're definitely going to be able to point you in the right direction.